Welcome to the Plato Paradigm, a paradigm shift in reading Plato's dialogues. Episode 38, Euthyphro 4e to 5b. Euthyphro is convinced that he knows what the holy is, to Hosion, but his family are equally convinced that he doesn't know, he's in the wrong, and we may also remember that in the public assembly, the Athenian citizens, other than Euthyphro, think that he's mad when he talks about divine things. Since this is the case, we might reasonably ask ourselves why Plato has bothered to have a dialogue in which one of the main speakers is so unrepresentative of the opinion of the Athenian many, given that Euthyphro and Socrates meet at the Stoa Basileos, and both of their cases will be held in the courts of the Archon Basileus, we may already understand that the concept under discussion is Tohosion itself, and that Euthyphro and Socrates in some way represent different aspects of Tohosion. But then we may ask ourselves, how could two such extreme characters represent aspects of Tohosion when most of the people disagree with both of them? I'm raising this point now so that you can get your bearings in a dialogue based on paradigms. Socrates and Euthyphro are both degmata of paradegmata, which are minimalist concrete representations of aspects of the central idea under discussion. A concept is black and white, and any aspects it may have are also black and white. They will be extreme and different from each other. And this is why we have two extreme characters. Most people are somewhere in the middle about this concept. Apparently, we haven't discussed it yet, but there is a great deal of confusion about Tohosion, apparently, which is why we have the opportunity in this dialogue to examine the whole concept using two extreme characters who represent the two different aspects. We'll soon be getting into what appears to be a philosophical discussion, but that shouldn't fool us. The philosophical position is dramatized by the characters. What they actually say to each other may be, and quite often is, nonsensical. We should be paying particular attention to the motivations of the characters and the opinions they actually have as opposed to opinions they may seem to have. In this regard, Euthyphro is actually more straightforward than Socrates. Euthyphro says what he thinks, he doesn't care what other people think, but he needs to show them that he knows. It's one of the qualities of Socrates that he can claim not to know something, and yet he does know. We get hints of that, for example, when he was talking about Meletus, where he said he doesn't quite know the man, but then he goes into detail. It's no accident that we get this demonstration of the way Socrates works in a non-philosophical context, before the philosophical, so-called philosophical discussion begins. I mentioned the confusion of the many, and this is represented by the very fact that both cases, that of Socrates and that of Euthyphro, are to be held in the very same court of law. The chance encounter outside the Stoa Basileos and the description of the two cases is often considered to be the dramatic setting designed to draw the reader into the dialogue before the philosophical discussion. That There are two assumptions here. One is that the philosophical discussion will be very boring which is why we need this uh, enticement at the beginning. And the second assumption is that there is a philosophical discussion. 
we'll see how philosophical the discussion is when we get to it. We're almost there now. We're just at the beginning where Socrates is going to manipulate Euthyphro into discussing the concept of Hosion with him. Euthyphro has just said that his family knows badly about the holy and the unholy, and this is how Socrates reacts. Sudede pros dios o Euthyphron, hutasi acribos oie epistos thai periton theon hope eche, kaiton hosion te kai anosion, hostetuton huto prachthenton hos su leges, ufo be dicadzomenos to patri hopos me au su anosion pragma tunchanes praton. But you, by Zeus, Euthyphro, do you think you know so accurately about divine things, how they stand, both about the holy and the unholy things? These things having been done thus, as you say, you're not afraid to take your father to court so that, again, you may happen to be doing an unholy thing. Deed. Socrates is reiterating the fear that the family has that Euthyphro may actually be bringing miasma by prosecuting his father. But instead of criticizing Euthyphro, Socrates goes along with Euthyphro's claim that he does know accurately what Tahosion is. I should point out that miasma is mentioned explicitly only once in the dialogue, but the connection is made between the unholy and miasma and the need to purify injustice. The actions of Euthyphro, his father, and his family all indicate that they are afraid of miasma. And this is something Socrates picks up on in his question. Aren't you afraid that you will do something unholy by prosecuting your father? Euthyphro replies, Uden garan mu ophelos eie o Socrates udeto antiafero euthyphron ton polon anthropon e me tatoi auta panta acribos e deien. Euthyphro's implicit answer is, no, I am not afraid. He begins his answer with for, to explain why he isn't afraid. For there would be no use of me, that is, uh, I would be useless, Socrates, nor would Euthyphro differ from any one of the many people if... I were not to know all such things accurately. Is Euthyphro simply boasting? Is this Plato's attempt to set up an easy target for Socrates to shoot down? Or should we try to see in what way Euthyphro may actually know something about Tohosion accurately? Euthyphro is certainly not just boasting, because he's putting his own reputation on the line, possibly his own life. You never know what might happen in a court of law, as we see with Socrates. Euthyphro believes that his accurate knowledge is to his advantage, and he believes that he is different from everybody else. This would imply that the many do not have this particular accurate knowledge about Tohosion. Euthyphro regards Socrates as a mantis like himself and does not include him among the many, but we still have to see whether Socrates has the same sort of accurate knowledge that Euthyphro has. He probably doesn't, because if they represent two different aspects of Tahosion, they should differ in some way. We haven't yet had an example of this accurate knowledge, but Socrates behaves as if he's extremely impressed. Arun moio thamasia Euthyphron, gratis tones di mathetes o Well then, oh amazing Euthyphro, 
it's best for me to become your pupil. This is a tactic Socrates often uses with people who claim to have knowledge of a subject. By becoming their student, he obliges them to explain their knowledge to him and he can ask questions as if he doesn't understand and then they have to think more. It's a good tactic for dialectic. In the present circumstances, Socrates even has a plausible excuse because he has his own trial and if he knows what Tahosion is, then he will do well in his trial. Kai protes grafes tes pros meleton, auta tauta procalesta auton, legonta oti egoge, kai ento empros ten chrono, ta thea peripolu epoiumen e denai. Kai nun epede me ekenos autos rediad son tafes, kai kai notomunta periton theon examartanen, mathetes de gegonas sos. And instead of the graphe, the writ, before Meletos, it is best for me to summon him about these same things, saying that I, for my part, even before, highly valued knowing about divine things, and now, since he claims that I am sinning by making things up and innovating about divine things, I have become your pupil. Kai amen, o mele te fai en an, iu thifrona homologes ofone nai tatoe auta, orthos nomitzen kai me hegu kai me dikadzu ed me, e keno to deskalo lache diken protoron e emoi, hostus presbuterus diatheronti Emete kai ton hautu patera, ememen didaskunti, e kenunde nusetun ti te kai koladzunti. I would say, and if, Meletus, you agree that Euthyphro is sophos, wise or an expert in such things, then consider me as well to believe correctly and don't prosecute. But if not... That is, if you don't think that he is an expert, then prosecute him before me. Make make a dike against him, which is interesting, a dike, not a grafe, as someone corrupting the older people. Remember that Meletus is prosecuting Socrates for corrupting the youth. The older people, both me and his father, me by teaching, and him, the father, by chastising and punishing. Socrates has a little more to say about this. We'll see that next time. But this is the plan. And remember that the plan is to get Euthyphro talking about Tohosion. This has nothing to do with Socrates' own trial. <laughs>